Hi, I'm Neil Dobson, the People's Arts. I'm the marine archaeologist on board the Odyssey Explorer. This is my second home. This is where I spend all my time at sea. As you can see, we're going down the uh, port side of the ship. And what I'd like to do is come on board with me and we'll have a look around and I'll show you what my life's like on board the Explorer. This is where I spend most of my time, 12 hours a day in the offline room, doing my work, looking at wrecks. But today I'm going to take you around the ship and have a look. So, uh, guys, uh, we're here on the Strange Oddities podcast with Mr. Neil Dobson. I'm excited to have him as a guest here on the podcast. I feel like a kid because uh, growing up, uh, you know, we, we read lots of treasure books about pirates and, uh, you know, all the amazing uh, black from Blackbeard to uh, Captain Kidd, uh, who also has connection here in Long Island, New York, um, believe it or not, uh, has some history here. And Mr. Dobson has been on various TV shows, BBC America. He's been on, uh, I believe, National Geographic if I'm not mistaken. And uh, he's also been on a show that many of you probably heard of, Treasure Quest as well. Um, and so, I, it, Neil, it's a pleasure to have you on, on the podcast. Thanks for being here. Um, welcome to the show. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to get to talk about uh everything I'm passionate about, which is shipwrecks. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So like like we were saying uh, before we started the interview, um, you, you have quite a few titles that you go by. Uh, people know you, known, known you as uh, either a treasure hunter slash shipwreck hunter, but mostly you're, you're, you're into uh, marine archaeology um, and the research of shipwrecks during World War I and World War II mostly. Um, Tell our audience a little bit, give a brief background of how you got started. Uh, you know, tell a little bit about yourself and uh, your company that you work with. But that's a separate show and it's <laughs> in its own. Um, th this month, I well, this, this year I'm celebrating the start of my 50th year. Wow. At sea in some shape or form. Congratulations. <laughs> when I was 16, 17, I decided that I, I wanted to, instead of being a history teacher, because that's what I wanted to do, I decided that I wanted to go and see the world first. Uh, and then I could go and do history or or, or whatever. So I, I joined the Merchant Marine Service and I was trained and did my apprenticeship on the decks of uh, cargo ships, container ships, um, and uh, was a deck officer. Um, Sadly, I always picked the wrong time and there was a downturn in the merchant shipping uh, world. Mm -hmm. And I ended up 
going out, one of the first group of people from Scotland to go out and work in the North Sea oil rigs. Mm. So from 1979, it was working with all these people from <laughs> the deep south, all the, the drillers and tool pushers and roughnecks. And I was on uh, Norwegian drilling rigs for 11, 12, 12 years out in the North Sea, Irish Sea, um, drilling and ex ex exploration for, for oil. I became, when I was home on leave, I got into sport diving. And when I, because a friend of mine had, had a commercial diving uh, company, so he threw me in the water and I thought, oh, this is nice. <laughs> and then uh, I learned to scuba dive and then I became an instructor and ran a local club. And then at my local university at St Andrews, um, there was the Scottish Institute of Maritime Studies. And they used to meet me in a pub on the Friday night and would talk shipwrecks. And they got hooked into doing shipwrecks as, as a marine archaeologist. Um, I then came ashore and worked as a survival instructor in the oil industry, which was me teaching people how to, to drive lifeboats, how to evacuate rig, how to deal with helicopter crashes. And, and then finally, um, as the result of the Piper Alpha disaster, mm. um, I became one of Britain's first freefall lifeboats. I used to drop lifeboats off a tower yeah. uh, three metres high into the water. Uh, so that was fun. Um, that sadly, the, the the survival state place moved, and I decided now's the time's right that I'm going to go to university. So took a risk. Eighteen months later, I got my master's in marine archaeology. Nice. I didn't know there was no jobs, and then I decided, you know what, I'm going to be an ROV pilot. Let's see <laughs> if I can use my industry my background and do archaeology. So I went and trained as an ROV pilot, got no work out of that because everybody else then they wanted <laughs> <laughs> wanted um, <clears throat> electrical guys, mechanical guys. I was a commercial diver by that time uh, and I could pilot things, but uh, there was no work. So luckily, <laughs> along with Odyssey Marine Exploration in 2001, and they took me on because I had all this... Uh, offshore background and the archaeology background and, and the rest that's been history the first wreck doing them was the uh republic the ss republic nice uh, that was our first treasure treasure wreck nice awesome that was really awesome you have such such uh you know uh commending uh background like really respectable um from the start of your career to what you do now um yeah, as far as uh, diving and, and finding these shipwrecks with the technology that you guys are using now, uh, the RV uh, equipment and whatnot, um, what's your most favorite part of the expeditions you're involved with when you're finding shipwrecks? What's your favorite part of it? Is it the research, um, the technology end of things, uh, the diving? What's your favorite part of it? Well, it all, all good shipwrecks start with research. If you if you don't do the research, you're not going to find it. Sure. There's millions and hundreds of millions of shipwrecks in the world. I've not <laughs> found them all yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's so many out there. <laughs> the, the key to it is good research. If you can get good research from that, you can plan your search, your search area. Shipwrecks cost money. Oh, yeah. Cost money. Archaeologists cost money. Maybe not as much as you should get, but <laughs> they cost money. Um, and there's always that risk. Are you going to be successful or not? You never, ever get all the treasure out. There's always some that's lost or you can't get at it or it's gone or, mm -hmm. or you get there. For me, the challenge is, A, when you find it, we've got the technology, even in the 20 years, 20 plus years that I've been doing it, when I, I look at the uh, side scan equipment and technology 20 years ago, and I look now, wow. Yeah, well, what an advance uh, from then to now. Yeah, absolutely. We have 3D, we have, you know, you could go down multi beam uh, echo sounder, uh, a, a shipwreck, and from that data, I could print out a 3D model of it that, could, that I could hold in my hands and show everybody. Wow. That's you know, awesome. So, wow, the technology is all geared now for it. But that comes at a price. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the biggest kick I get is when I'm sat there and the ROE pilots are, are down and we're going down deep. Oh, wow. I don't know what I'm going to see. I might have had seen a, a multi-beam image of the wreck, but if not, 
it's that first image you get, the first person possibly to see that wreck since it sunk. That's like, wow. Yeah, yeah. And from then on, it's just exploration. After that, sometimes I'd be up 20 hours sitting at a screen watching the <laughs> show. And that's you awesome. see everything different. I think that is, that's the best moment for me. And then, obviously, you have to do the, the work and do the survey and do the yeah. archaeology. And depending on what the project is, whether it's archaeology or salvage, then you give your, your, your advice and then you start doing the work on the wreck. And then you make discoveries. You make discoveries you never think you're going you're gonna, to uh, <clears throat> find. Yeah. I mean, for me, I was so lucky to be able to do the SS Republic, which mm -hmm. was post-Civil War side wheel paddle steamer. Wow. And later, in 2014, I got asked to go and finish off the, the Central America, the Ship of Gold, which was a pre-Civil uh, War one. And that was just fantastic. I really need a third side wheel paddle steamer. Possibly, <laughs> if it's in between halfway through the American Civil War, I'll I'll have the full collection. I don't know anybody else that's that's worked on uh, as many uh, side wheel steamers as I have. So, wow. those were, I think, the most interesting from the from the point of view of what was on board the ship yeah. um, and and everything else. Because shipwrecks are events that are not meant to happen. Yeah. Yeah, no. Um, when you go on a land site, it's usually rubbish that you get. It'll be a broken bottle, right. it'll be a broken machine, it'll be a pattern machine, right. it'll be damaged coins. Whereas on a shipwreck, you get stuff that's never been, you know, mint coins. You get cargoes. You get hundreds of items instead of finding one broken one. Mm -hmm. But the biggest thing is, it's like a window on time. So yeah. you see all that there, you think, wow. This is like hitting Amazon. <laughs> <don't know> <laughs> nice. It's full of stuff. Yeah. It's just full of all the goods, items, personal effects, fashions that tell you a slice of time. And for me, as I suppose my love of history, that, yeah. that's great to get that window into the past. And shipwrecks yeah. are amazing for that. Yeah, so yeah. Shipwrecks don't last underwater, but... Yeah. <laughs> what, are, what are the... Um, I guess besides uh, the one that you mentioned with the Civil War, what are some of the oldest shipwrecks that you've come across in your time? Oh, well, I've been fortunate enough uh, once out in the Mediterranean to see early Roman uh, oh, wow. cargo wrecks in the deep parts of the, of the eastern and western Med. And usually that's um, a nice fine, a, a nice array of amphora or these storage jars that are laid out carrying all the different cargo, and there may be some wood. Seeing that kind of says, wow, this this is going way back, way, 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 way back before, you know, time before, I mean, before even before the Romans were in Britain in some cases. <laughs> wow. So that's an interest. They're the oldest ones. Um, the newest ones I've been on have been, uh, <coughs> excuse me, have been about World War II, uh, having my time looked at lost fishing boats uh, wow. without for other people, modern stuff. Yeah. But, you know, I've seen quite a lot. I've still yet to find a Viking ship. That for me would, that would be. A, oh, that a, would be a, cool. Find, yeah. Find a Viking ship. Yeah. That would be kind of cool. Um, they were, they, they were an amazing uh, group of people. Nice. Nice. Yeah, that would be awesome. Uh, I'm a huge fan of uh, Viking era. Um, I probably have family heritage connected there because I'm also half uh, I'm half Irish and Scottish myself. Um, and I would love. Yeah, like that. That would be cool. Yeah. <laughs> My background, I'm, I'm possibly I would like to think I'm Pictish, but I would also like to think I had a bit of Viking in me as well. But, yeah. you know, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, when you guys pull artifacts, which I'm sure you guys got like, oh, my God, I can't imagine how many artifacts you pull from shipwreck. What's the process or procedure that you guys follow um, to preserve? Because when they're underwater for that time, I can't imagine um, some of the artifacts that you you obviously take a risk of them uh, getting damaged more or losing them uh, before pulling them up out of the water. What's your process for that, for preserving? Well, I mean, everything starts, 
before you even start, if, if you're doing a shipwrecks like like the SS Republic or, or the Central America, you have to have, <clears throat> even before you start, you have to have a conservation plan in process. You, you'll know roughly what kind of items you're going to expect, whether they're organics, whether they're different types of metal, wood, cloth, paper, uh, you name it all. Um, <clears throat> you have a good idea what to expect. What you don't expect is some things are better preserved than you thought that would go. I mean, writing, um, I remember seeing on the Central America, there was a little package and it was a, it's still in its paper and it was chewing tobacco from 1850. Oh, wow. <laughs> I thought, wow, that's, that's made it. And that would be something that you thought would, would never, never last. Mm. And in other cases, you, there's a case when we found the bell, right away on the Republic, and we knew it was Republic because the Republic was called SS Tennessee. Mm -hmm. was the Republic, And here was a bell sitting on the seabed with Tennessee written on it. But the <laughs> bell was badly corroded, uh, and the Gulf Stream was badly cro corroded, and it was suffering from bronze, uh, sort of bronze brass disease. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very uh, delicate. They did, and that was a challenge. So, you know, you, you look at it, you have to think, using my experience, recovery is the hardest point. Yeah. Our guys with the robots had skills and were able to pick anything up with a limpet suction device. Yeah. Didn't damage it. But when it comes up through the water column, you've got to protect it because when it comes through that interface on the surface where the swell is, that can wash it, wash or damage things. So you had to protect it. Um, and, and it's fairly basic. I mean, I remember working on a Cromwellian uh, warship as a, as a diver, and I had a, a leather shoe to recover, and I thought, well, it's a bit floppy. How am I going to deal with this? So yeah. I decided that I would get from the from the kitchen in the caravan a fish slice, you know, and yeah. a band. So what I did was I slipped the, the, the fish slice under the leather shoe mm -hmm. to support it lifted it and wrapped it in a white and a and a wet bandage and then brought it to the surface and put it in the bucket and then it was kept obviously i like to keep things in salt water okay coins and stuff like that keep it in salt water until you can get it to a lab and then they can start the conservation too because some fresh water that you have might have a bit of chlorine in it and everything else so yeah first end for me is Keep it cold, keep it dark, and keep it in what you found it until you can get a, a conservator on the go. Yeah. And conversa conservation can take months, years. Yeah. And the cost to that is, is, as well. Right. But it, it's pretty amazing when I think that I've recovered something from maybe two, 3,000 metres deep in the seabed. Wow. Yeah, that's actually, um, that was actually going to be another question on mine. Like, what was the deepest, um, you know, artifact that you ever pulled up? All right. For me, it was uh, 4,690 meters. So that's wow. four, four times the depth of the Titanic. Oh, wow. <laughs> and that was the SS Gear Sopa from World War II, a British cargo ship. And <clears throat> we were, I luckily, I went out to identify that. That, that, that's another favourite of mine because my father was a radio operator with the same shipping company. Mm. When the ship broke, it broke and I could see inside the radio room. And I could also see the cabin, the radio officer's cabin. And for me, that was like, wow, I've been transported back in time <laughs> and I'm with my late father because this is how he lived. That is the same equipment. It was amazing. Wow. It, the value wise was very, you know, it's still down there. We wouldn't recover it. Yeah. Just having that window in time to see how my father was at my age walking around the ship. It was, that was probably the best moment I've ever had. <laughs> <done>. <laughs> well, that's cool. That's really cool. Like, like total, total nostalgia. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. So um, my next question for you is, 
Would you give our viewers and listeners uh, a little bit of background about your company? Because I know, um, you know, you're, you're very fortunate to have uh, this company called Rovar. If I, I pronounced that correctly, right? Yeah, Ro Rovarch. Well, Rovarch started when I was doing my degree. I <clears throat> just finished. I finished my degree, couldn't get any jobs, did an ROV pilot uh, training course and came back. And I thought, right, I've got a market myself. I need to get a name. So I came up with Rovarch, which stands for Roving Archaeologist mm. or ROV Archaeologist. Wow. So, I knew there had to be a, a, an acronym for it. <laughs> so I had two, Rovarch, ROV Archaeologist, Roving Archaeologist, meaning that I would go anywhere to do uh, marine archaeology. Nice. So I set the company up as a consultancy, and then, <clears throat> as usual, I wrote to every treasure hunter, Every marine archaeologist, departments, everywhere, Woods Hole, the whole lot, trying to get a job. <laughs> <laughs> Got nowhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, just by chance, when I was on a marine archaeology form, um, Craig Stem and Odyssey Marine Exploration gave me a call and said, hey, we, we need somebody with your skill. Are you okay being at sea? I says, I love going to sea, you know. Uh, are you okay with 12 hour shifts and working night shifts? Yeah, yeah, I'm not fussy so long as I'm on ship. looking at shipwrecks. I don't yeah. I don't really I don't really care. So I was very fortunate to to be with it with be with them for over 15, 16 years cool. uh, doing all the stuff and learning the technology and working with the ROVs specifically to do deep water marine archaeology because there's nobody else like me that has got that sea time in. You're not going to be a marine archaeologist by driving a desk. <laughs> right, right, exactly. At some, at some point, you're going to have to get out in the field, get on a boat, not be back in for tea or off at the weekend. Yeah. And go out there and do it, and that's the only way. And, and I've been very fortunate because, because of my background. I, I know ships. I know the industry. I know what it's like to be at sea. I know what the life of ship's crews are so that gave me a lot of understanding and I, and I can relate to that uh, when I'm looking at ancient ships or pirate ships uh, I, I, I can understand how these how the crews and people work because I'm a professional sailor myself so yeah yeah and not much has changed to be in, in a way it's still the same a lot of things that happened at sea in the 17th and 18th century happened in the 20th century when I was a, a young lad at sea so nice nice that's very, really cool. Um, let's see. Uh, I got my list of questions here. I'm going over everything because we have cramming in to like around 40 minutes here. And I have so many questions that I don't want to miss. Um, so those who are tuning in late to our show, uh, we have Mr. Neil Dobson uh, from Ro Rovarch. And um, we're, you know, we're diving into a lot of things and, and I'm excited uh, to be part of this uh, interview. And uh, again, I'm so grateful, Neil, that you can even be part of the show. Um, what are your current projects that you are working on? Uh, is there anything big that you're, that you're into now? Or oh, Yeah, there's lots at the moment. Um, I'm with a company called Britannia's Gold Limited, based in London, and they nice. do salvage of World War One and World War Two wrecks. And in fact, I, I might be going out into the the cold North Atlantic in a, in a few weeks' time to do some surveys well off, a couple hundred miles off the west coast of, of, yeah. of Ireland to, to look for some uh, targets there to find them <laughs> and then plan for, uh, plan for salvage. I also get a lot of people contact me asking me about how would I do this or that, you know. Sure. Um, I would love to get out on the San Jose. That would be a cool gig off Colombia, you know. Okay, <laughs> yeah. If or not, but uh, I certainly have the the background and the and the experience to to be able to to do that one because um, I've done it. That, yeah. that's, uh, I'm not new to this. I've <laughs> successfully yeah. uh, cargoes using ROVs, so I know the process and. You know, depending on what people want, if they want to do 100% full blown marine archaeology with an ROV, you, you can. A lot of people say you can't, but you can. I've done it. Yeah, absolutely. And if you just want to pick, then you pick. So long as you are clear about what the goals are and that, and, and don't say that you're a treasure hunter when you're not, and don't <laughs> be a marine archaeologist when you're a treasure hunter. I, yeah. there's, there's no issue with that, but you know. 
Yeah. Have a, I mean, the biggest issue we have at the moment is all those wrecks from World War One and World War Two. They've all been underwater for a hundred years, coming up, you know, even more. Yeah. And, and what's happening is uh, the metal is it's in salt water, so eventually it's going to rust. And some of these ships have organic cargoes that are pollutant. Okay. Oils, lubricating oils. Okay. Fuel oil. So eventually, they're going to start cracking open. Oh wow! Yeah. So what what what's the um, procedure, or what do you have to follow if something like that were to occur, to occur? Well, I mean, nowadays because we're more and and rightly so. Um, before I now work on any uh, steel shipwreck, we would do a survey and we would do a special specialist pollution survey. Mm. Where, and in some cases, if it's been attacked by a submarine and it's gone on fire, you can pretty much guarantee that there's no fuel. Okay. But there might be drums of oil left in the in the hold that would be used for the ship's maintenance. And you can imagine even one oil drum leaking out make, looks bad on the surface and it's, and it's pollution. Mm. And if you've got a cargo of oil drums that did not go on fire, eventually... This this can this this can leak out. So we're very strict on uh, doing proper pollution surveys uh, and then evaluating the, the risk of that. But more importantly, having in place should anything like that happen. I, I've been on a World War One wreck where it started to release um, crates of lard oh. from World War Two uh, from World War One. And these floated up to surface, and there was a stream of them all heading oh, no. to the North Atlantic. <laughs> wow! Now, the lad floated, and it and it didn't smell very nice, but it could come ashore and cause a problem. So we, we gathered that up. So you, you you've got to just be prepared nowadays to think yeah. about well, these steel wrecks are never going to last forever. The Titanic's not going to be here in eighty years' time, I reckon. Yeah, you know, it's, oh. it's going to be a stain uh, on the seabed, and wow. All World War One and World War Two stuff is the same. Yeah, it's going to start leaking. What happens to submarines? I mean, they've got a thicker hull. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. They'll go, and what's going to be released from from there? So yeah. we really now have to start thinking, and governments have to start thinking about how we're going to manage this. If it's in my waters and it's a German ship, should the Germans pay for the pollution? because it's their ship, or should I pay for it because it's in my waters, or should the British pay for it because they sunk it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's that's a great debate for the, for, for the future. It's great finding wooden wrecks because wooden wrecks, the wood deteriorates unless it's well buried, and then you've you got the usual ballast mount, the, the stones that were used to ballast the ship, and then you've got your cannons, you've got your anchor, you've got your pottery. <laughs> that, that goes on for thousands of years. That's pretty... Yeah pretty cool but yeah. it's not it's and it's fairly flat on the seabed whereas world war one and world war two ships can be three or four or five meters high off the seabed <laughs> with all the steel so we, we have to have a way of looking at it and thinking well okay <laughs> every shipwreck's got a story some are yeah. more important than others and you've just got to record that and then do what you have to do with it um yeah. and if today especially as i see it now We've got to think about the planet, and, and instead of digging for some metals, let's go and get the metals from the shipwrecks. Yeah, yeah, good. Recycle, you know. Do you want to take half a mountain away, or do you just want to go to certain shipwrecks that you know that have the same material and recover that? So, right. I think we have to look a lot bit more uh, about it, and th there's obviously going to be the great debate with everybody about those that don't want any shipwrecks ever mm -hmm. to. Uh, yeah. That, that that was going to be another line of uh, one of my questions that I want to get in there was because um, uh, I'm glad you touched on that because I'm sure that that's one of the dangers that's involved in uh, doing these expeditions because, yeah, if there's a breach uh, with that stuff that you just mentioned, um, you know, you got to be careful. And, and uh, there's a lot of red tape with the government, uh, you know, uh, the protection agencies that are involved, um, you know, the ocean, you know, we got to protect the the light that's in the ocean and all that. So I'm glad you brought that up because that was going to be one of my next questions. Um, other than that, what are some of the other danger dangers that you guys run into? Uh, probably storms, right? Oh, gosh, yeah. I mean, I've had my fair share of hurricanes uh, <laughs> and typhoons. Um, 
usually, you know, we'd, we'd be out on, on the east coast of America uh, this time of the year, which is hurricane season. Uh, and a few times I've had to sail out until, I mean, I would rather go out and face the hurricane or go away from it than go in port. Because when you're tied up in port, there's more chance of damage than than uh, I was caught in Baltimore and the whole area was flooded during, after a hurricane. Oh. And the last, last hurricane, we were dodging hurricanes off uh, Charleston, Savannah. Mm -hmm. With the, the Central America, and all we did was sail out two or three hundred miles in a big circle, and let the hurricane come up the coast and go away. Then came in behind it, you know. Yeah, but I love rough weather at sea, and I'm lucky I don't get seasick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's in that way. So uh, yeah, I mean th that's danger at sea. There's always that kind of worry that yeah. Uh, that something can happen, the ship can break down. Yeah. You've also got to think about the ROV itself, especially when you're working in steel shipwrecks. Um, I'm not going to go into that hold, you know, let's go in, let's have a look, let's have a look, let's get closer, because the ROV has an umbilical going up to the surface. Okay. You don't want to snag your umbilical or snag the ROV, and then yeah. you oh, I've got five or six million quid's worth of equipment stuck on the seabed. Yeah. You yeah. have to do something, so... You just have to take your time. Uh, it's a challenge, but part part of it is if you have good plan and you have a good team, then you can you, you assess this when you do your surveys, you know. Yeah. And then you usually get a good result, and you end up bringing up the gold and silver or right. little, little discs, I call them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, but but good thing you have you know behind you you have years of experience behind you uh, to tackle those kind of dangers. So uh, you wouldn't be here if you didn't have that kind of experience. No, no, no. I mean I've seen some <laughs> things go on it. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I I can't imagine. So uh, Neil, we have a little less than five minutes here in the interview left. Um, I want to make sure we uh, get all your information out there uh, to our audience. Where can people find you? You have events coming up that you like to share. Um, do you lecture? Do you give talks? Or yeah, um, you know, I'm available, and I love to give talks on podcasts. Uh, conferences, local groups. I, I do a lot of uh, local history talks. Um, one thing I'm quite involved in at the moment is Captain Kidd. Captain yeah. Kidd, your pirate and the Scotsman that was born only 15 miles away from where I live just now, St Andrews in Scotland. He was born in Dundee. Uh, he ended up working uh, in America for a lot. In fact, he married an American and his, one of his first big houses was on Wall Street. Nice. <laughs> Scotsman living in Wall Street. I think that's a great story. He was a, a, a character and a half, and well, he was a privateer, and then he he, he got involved uh, with the royals in Britain and went out to work with them, and ended up doing a little bit of piracy. And then they didn't want a scandal with the royal family, King William, so. They ended up making him the fall guy. And right. he had an incident on a boat where the crew was mutiny and one of them that had really bad scurvy uh, made a lunge at Kid. And Kid picked up a bucket and swung it and it just so happened it contacted with his head and killed him. Oh, he wow. was half dead with, um, with scurvy anyway. Anyway, that was sufficient enough to say, oh, you're a murderer. Probably if it was today, he would have gave him a bad rap, yeah. <laughs> He, got, he would have gotten away with manslaughter, you know, but it wasn't premeditated or anything. Right, right. He was wrongly taken uh, to London, and all the people he worked with sort of turned against him. He did have proof, French papers, that said that he, what he was doing was legitimate and doing it for the king. Um, they suddenly disappeared before the trial, and he was guilty. They hung him, and they didn't get the weight right. And they had to hang him again. Wow, <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, the poor thing. So I'm involved in a, a in a project. And if you go online, you can go and look it up. And it's Pardon Captain Kidd. Yeah, I was going to mention that, actually, uh, real quick. Uh, if, to, uh, if you go yeah. there, you get the whole, the whole story. And I'm hoping that one day that he does get a royal pardon for, for being wrongly. I mean, he, he should have done time, but he shouldn't have been hung. That's yeah. That's, I mean, other than that, I'm, I, I still have, uh, I still go for 
getting on documentaries and I'm, I'm well, available for any documentaries. So if Jeff Gates or any of these guys are out there listening. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Nice. Projects with you. Um, yeah. Fairly contactable on my website, Rovarch. Uh, com. have a look in there email me chat to me and i'm, I'm happy to do anything like this and awesome. we'll have a chance to talk again on other subjects because i haven't even started on shipwrecks and pirates yet oh i know i know uh that's going to be another episode uh during this season of po strange oddities podcast um we would i i would love to do a second part interview with you uh just based on that i would love to schedule you for that if if you're up for that yeah, I'm up for it. Yeah, anything. Yeah, and I would love to ask you all about your paranormal stuff because I'm a big Bigfoot fan, believe it or not. For all my friends, I would love to be the Scotsman that found a Sasquatch. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Pacific Northwest, but there, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but on our in our second part interview, we'll definitely get into the uh, you know, the the pirateers like Blackburn and Captain Kidd. And, oh yeah, they're amazing people. Yeah, 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 yeah. And like you said, uh, you know, he was wrongfully uh, accused of many things, and, and and in my opinion, I think he was like the Robin Hood of uh, pirates. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, he was in a way. I mean, he was a grumpy old Scot for his age. He probably wasn't <laughs> to get on with. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I think he, he was wrong. I mean, had I been on the go during that period, 18th century, 17th, 18th century, I certainly would have been on a privateer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they're not all bad. Yeah. I mean, there's pirates, there's bad pirates. Um, they, they had a great uh, code and uh, conduct, and I think a lot of governments and politicians would do well by uh, looking at how pirates looked after each other and board the ship. It was a fair society, quite yeah. a good Right to, to be in, you know, if yeah. you lost, if you lost your arm or your leg in a battle on a pirate ship, then you got compensated for it, which is pretty cool. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, it is. You wouldn't. So they did look after each other, and yeah. if you were a privateer, you had a, a letter to go and do these uh, kind of acts and that. You know, yeah, it, it would be a, it would be a quite a rewarding life. I think I would have been. I reckon I would have done well as a privateer. And <laughs> who knows? Maybe you were in a past life. <laughs> And that's how you become who you are now, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Neil, it was a great pleasure uh, having you on this interview. Um, I hope you had fun. I know I did. Uh, I, I thought it was a great interview. Um, again, we'll have to do a second part interview. Oh, and yeah, we'll talk quite sure, yeah. I'm happy to talk about...